And so, uh, without further ado, we'll go on to Acts 15. Now, we've been talking about in the book of Acts about a really big transition that took place, and that is when the Gentiles were able to come into the household of faith. Now, we talked about it in the old law. If somebody was not a Jew physically, they had to proselytize, which means they had to go through a certain process to become a Jewish resident. They could become a, an alien, but then they could become a, a proselyte Jew, which meant that they were a Gentile by birth, but had gone through the conversion process, if you will, of becoming a full-fledged Jewish individual. Well, we see that there's a transition that takes place in Acts chapter 10, when we have the first Gentile convert, who is... Cornelius. And we can see how it's a big deal. And Peter's not really sure what's going on. He gets back to Jerusalem in Acts 11. There's a conference that takes place where they're like, can Gentiles even be Christians? Is it, is so, can they be baptized? Is this okay? And they talk about that. Then we go on and we see in chapter 11 the first Gentile congregation, which is going to be where? Antioch, right? And they get a new name in Antioch. What's their new name? Christians, right? Because before everybody was Jews. And so it was almost like Christianity was a sect of Judaism because everybody was Jewish. But now we've got a large Gentile population in Antioch, and now we need a new name because these aren't Jews anymore. And so the name is given and it is Christians. And then we see that Paul and Barnabas go on the first missionary journey. And they go to this Gentile territory, and they go to these Gentile places, and they have many Gentile converts. And so they get back to Antioch, and that's where we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 15, and we're going to see this, this controversy over the Gentiles becoming Christians. It's still going to be a key issue for the church. And so this is going to be around 48 A.D. And remember that, because this is really important, because this is about 48 A.D. The church has been in existence now for about 20 years. Paul has been a convert of Christianity for about 17 years. And Cornelius was converted about 10 years earlier. And so the first Gentile convert in Acts chapter 10 to Acts 15 has been about 10 years. And they're still having issues as to whether or not Gentiles can be full-fledged members and what it means to be a Gentile and also be a Christian. And so let's go ahead and let's get at the dispute that takes place in Antioch in verses 1-5. through 5 of chapter 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through the Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and that brought great joy to all the brothers. And when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the elders and the apostles, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them in order that they to keep the law of Moses. And so here we have this idea of circumcision and its requirements. And so the idea that they have a, a portion of those who were Jewish Christians firmly believed that if someone was going to be a Christian and they were Gentile, they were first going to have to be circumcised. Circumcision was given even even before the law of Moses, back to which patriarchal father? Abraham, right? And they said, this supersedes um, the law of Moses. And if you're telling me that they, they, they can have the blessing that was meant for Abraham and his offspring, and in Genesis chapter 17, God says that your offspring are going to be circumcised, and this is going to be my covenant between you and me, they've got to be circumcised. And you'll see Galatians, even when Paul writes the book of Galatians, which is about this time frame. Paul's going to talk about that in great detail in Galatians chapter 2 and chapter 3. And so he talks about the idea of, it is not circumcision that allows someone to be a descendant of Abraham, but baptism. He talks about that in Galatians 3 verses 27 through 29. And so there's this idea, is this a requirement? The Judaizer would say, how can they be God's people if they will not wear the mark of God? Their idea of the mark of God is what? Circumcision. How can you be God's person if you don't wear God's mark? Now, Paul would say that they do wear God's mark, but today God's mark is baptism, not circumcision. He makes this point in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. If you've never read that passage, it's very important to think about that Colossians is written a little bit after this takes place, but the idea is still there. He says that there is a new circumcision, right? Right? 
we don't put off the flesh anymore. We put off the old man of sin, right? So we've been circumcised not with, with hands, but with the baptism of Christ Jesus. And he talks about that explicitly in Colossians 2, 11 through 15. And so this false teaching, and so they come, these men come to Antioch, and they're preaching there, and they have picked the wrong place to go and preach this message because if they knew or not, Paul and Barnabas was there. Now, who is Paul? As far I know you know who Paul is, but in his relationship to the Gentiles, looking for something specific. Well, he was a persecutor of the church earlier. But I'm thinking about Romans chapter 11, verse 13, where Paul says he was the... Bl- the chosen one, to go. The chosen one, right? And he uses a word there. He was the blank to the Gentiles. The apostle, right? And so you've got men coming to Antioch saying, you know what the Gentiles need to do? They need to be circumcised. And who are they telling this to? The apostle to the Gentiles. <laughs> like... It's like, you picked the wrong guy. Like You picked the wrong guy to mess with on this, on this issue. Uh, he's God's chosen instrument. And so it says here, they had no small dissension with him. So Paul and Barnabas took a pretty big issue because they had just gotten back from the first missionary journey to Gentile territory. It's like, not only am I the apostle to the Gentiles, I just got back from a two and a half year mission throughout Asia Minor where we established several congregations and converted hundreds of people like I think I know what I'm talking about here. I was there. I saw my own eyes. I saw him receive the Holy Spirit. You know, this is, this is not something that you can do. And so they had an issue with the teachers there. And so after much debate, the, uh, they're asked that Paul and Barnabas and some others will go to Jerusalem to talk to the apostles and the elders. This is important because where do these men come from? These false teachers. Judea, right? They had come from Jerusalem, which is in Judea. And so it was important for them to go back and get to the bottom of this matter. Now, it is understandable why this would have originated in this area, right? I mean, you're talking about a place where most of the people who live in Judea, especially Jerusalem, are all Jews. And the vast majority of Christians, if not all the Christians in this area, are all what? Are they Gentile Christians in Judea? They're all Jewish, right? And they've all been what? The males, at least. Circumcised. And from their youth, from the time they were born, right? This was God's mark of His people. This is what sets you apart. This is what makes you special, and the Gentiles are the uncircumcised. Just like they would call the, uh, the Philistines the uncircumcised in the Old Testament, that's what Gentiles were. And so they're having a hard time accepting the idea that circumcision means nothing under the new law. Brother Ricky? Uh, Yeah, it's a great question. And the reason why is because Timothy, and it's a great study to look at Timothy and Titus. And so you have Timothy who is half what? He's half Jew, right, by his mom. He's half Jew and he's half Gentile. But he's never been circumcised because he was raised... I guess his father just never saw fit for him to be circumcised when he was a child. And so, whenever Paul would go back to Jerusalem, it was a faux pas. Whenever they would go to the synagogues, or whenever they would go to Jerusalem, and for this half-Jew not to have been circumcised. And so, when Timothy was circumcised, it was not to keep the old law. Because Paul would say in um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 3, that if you circumcise yourself to appease the old law, then you have made yourself a slave to the entire old law. You've bound yourself to the entire old law. But what Paul is doing here when he circumcises Timothy is so that Timothy can go into the, the temple and to, and to preach and teach. If you were uncircumcised, you could not go into the, uh, the Jewish section of the temple. There was the court of women, the court of Gentiles, and then the court of, uh, of men. And also because... Um, it would have been harder for him to evangelize two Jews if he himself was an uncircumcised Jew. No. It's like um, he was saying that it was a cultural thing for Timothy to be. It goes back to what Paul says he became all things to all people. And kind of the idea of these people aren't going to listen to you or take you seriously if you don't do this, and so we're going to do this. And to Timothy's credit, he didn't have to do it. I mean, Timothy could have said, I don't have to do this. I'm not doing it. But in order to reach people and to be able to evangelize to the Jews, Timothy allowed himself to be circumcised. So, 
Good question. And so no, 15 and 16 aren't uh, contradictory, but they do show that the idea of you cannot bind it in, Gal in Acts chapter 15 backed up with Galatians 3 or Galatians chapter 5, but Timothy did use it as a cultural issue to appease uh, the Jews that he would be preaching to and teaching to, which is why Titus isn't. Um, you know, why did he circumcise Timothy and not Titus? <laughs> Titus wasn't a Jew. He didn't need to be circumcised. You know, there was no benefit. You know, because just like it would have helped the situation if Timothy was circumcised, it would have hurt the situation if Titus was circumcised. Why? Because he wasn't Jew, Gentile. And so if Paul's sitting here fighting with Jewish brothers who are holding on to circumcision, and they say, well then, why did you circumcise Titus? He's Gentile. You know, why would you do that? But they wouldn't say that with, with Timothy because it's assumed if you're a Jew, you're going to be circumcised. Because it was a, a cultural, it was an ethnic thing just as much as it was a religious thing. So, great question. Great question. Um, and so the church discusses the issue there. They go on their way. They stop and they tell about the many uh, Gentile converts in um, Phoenicia and also in Samaria. And they um, are excited. Now, a word is mentioned about this group who is really clinging to circumcision. What are they? They're Pharisees, right? And so... The text tells us that these Christians are from a Pharisaical background, which means they interpreted the law like Pharisees. We've talked about this before in this class and also in sermons, that Jesus, when you look at His interpretation of the old law, matches um, the Pharisees more than any other Jewish sect in the first century. Paul himself in Acts 23 verse 6 would say that he was a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. Now, now Paul was a Christian, he was an apostle, but he also interpreted the old law like a Pharisee would in most cases. But they were the one that took the law of Moses in the most strictest sense. And so it's, you know, it's pretty understandable why they would have been the ones that had the hardest issue with letting go with circumcision. Because, and, and honestly, they make a biblically-based argument. Now it's wrong, right? There are lots of people who make Bible-based arguments that are wrong. Right? I mean, they may go to some place like Romans chapter 11, you know, and say, you know, with, you know, with uh, confession, uh, Romans 11, 11, uh, uh, with confession uh, unto salvation. It, it's there. I don't know. I'm, I'm running off a little sleep this week. If you're a parent, you can tell. Um, that's a Bible-based argument, but it's wrong. Now, what the, what the Jews were doing, they were making a good Bible-based argument from Genesis 17. The text says, this will be my sign between me and your offspring forever. Olam, right? And they're saying, look, we can accept the Gentiles as God's people. But if you're God's person, you're circumcised. Genesis 17, it says, covenant forever. And so they're making a Bible-based argument. It's not like they're just trying to be ornery, right? They're just having a really hard time with Genesis 17 and the idea that if these people are going to be God's people, if you're telling me that they can be descendants of Abraham, the Bible tells me those people have got to be circumcised. Genesis 17. And, and Paul's the one that says, and you're looking at it wrong. You don't have to be circumcised. Romans 10.10, 10, right? I said 11.11, right? So I had the, 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 doublet, the double portion right, but not the actual number, right? Romans 10.10. 10. And so um, they get there, and they discuss the issue. And so let's look at verses 6 through 11. And uh, we see here Peter's response to the, to the question. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after they had been there much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as He did to us. And He made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed them, cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting um, God to the test by placing the yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Now, notice the deliberation doesn't take place behind closed doors. It mentions the apostles, the elders, but also the church that is there in. Um, 
in Jerusalem. And the church is mentioned again in verse 22 when they send the letter out. Uh, Peter and James are the ones whose responses are given in great detail. Uh, Peter and James are pillars in the church in Jerusalem. And uh, they represent the authority of the Jewish church there. Um, And Peter highlights the importance of the Jews and Gentiles receiving the same Holy Spirit and the same cleansing to enter in the kingdom. And so he says that, you know, despite what you may believe that we're better because we're Jews, we're descendants of, of Abraham, we're on the same footing before God. Well, not one of us is special than the others. And this is important because Peter had firsthand experience of this. Now, how long earlier do we say that likely Cornelius was converted? How long? Ten years, right? Cornelius is converted about ten years after the church is established. This takes place about ten years later. The church has been established for about 20 years. And so we have here, who better to give the first response that the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised to be Christians than the apostle who first preached the message to the Gentiles that saw the Holy Spirit descend on the Gentiles and baptize the first uncircumcised Gentiles? I mean, who better to give uh, a testimony, a witness about the Gentiles and God's uh, actions with the Gentiles than Peter? Right? And so Peter says, you know, I've got first-hand experience. I was in Caesarea 10 years ago when the Holy Spirit first came to the Gentiles. I was there. I've seen it with my own eyes. And uh, he says here that salvation comes not by faith and obedience to the old law, but faith and obedience to Christ Jesus. And so once he gets done speaking, it says the crowd became silent. And then another man is going to speak. And who's that? My red head? Anybody know? James, right? The Lord's brother. Let's look at what James says in verses 12 through 21. And all the assembly fell silent, and they listened to Barnabas and Paul, and they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. And after they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And when at this the words the prophets agreed, just as it is written, After this I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it. Then the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles Gentiles who call by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from the old. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual morality, and from what has been strangled and from blood. From the ancient, for the ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for it is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so Peter gives his speech about what he saw and what he witnessed. And then everybody becomes silent. They're not arguing anymore. And then Paul and Barnabas get up and say, now let us tell you what has happened on these missionary journeys that we've taken, or this one missionary journey we've taken to these different Gentile cities and how God has interacted with Gentiles there. And so James is sitting there and he's listening to Peter and he's listening to Paul and Barnabas, and then he gets up and he quotes from from, uh, Amos, rather, and he talks about how... um uh, what he suggests that they do. And so uh, this James is the Lord's brother. We're told that in Mark chapter 6, verse 3, that he did not believe in Jesus as the Son of God during Christ's earthly ministry, but that after seeing the resurrected Lord, he became a believer, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. We're also told that he was a pillar in the New Testament church there in Jerusalem, Galatians 1, Galatians 2, and also Acts 22, verse 17. And... Um, He was a man who was highly respected. I mean, this was the physical half-brother of uh, Jesus. And so James was a very important figure. In fact, his letter, uh, the book of James, is probably the first epistle written in the New Testament, probably written in the early early 40s. If that's true, that means the epistle of James is written even before um, this takes place. And so uh, James is recognized to have written an inspired epistle before this uh, conference took place. And so James is somebody that his his presence carried a lot of weight. And so James tells them um, that they should... um, should have four things to uh, bind to, to bind or to, to suggest to the Gentiles. And so he says that God has taken the Gentiles and given them his name. Now are we told in the book of Acts a name the Gentiles were? Now they're God's people. Right? 
A lot, a lot of mumbles, right? Christians, right? They're Christians. And so it is no coincidence that you have the name given in Acts chapter 11. And then in Acts chapter 15, it says that God was going to take from a people from the Gentiles and give Him His name, right? Well, Christ is God in the flesh, right? And so when we wear Christ's name, we, wear, we represent God, right? Uh, God who came in the flesh, Emmanuel. And so he talks about the tabernacle of David. Now, pre-millennialists will use this passage to talk about when Christ comes back and inaugurates the thousand-year reign that's going to take place in a physical reign where He's going to restore the nation of Israel back to His former glory. But that's not the way James uses the prophecy of Amos here in this passage. He says this is taking place right now in the culmination of bringing together both the, the Gentiles and Israel into one people of God. And so James is not a premillennialist. He doesn't believe in the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ Jesus fulfilling the prophecy given by Amos. He thinks that that's taking place during the church, during his day, and it's also taking place even today. Then he gives four uh, prohibitions. And these are found in Leviticus 17-18. through 18. This is important. Why did James suggest they tell the Gentiles to do these four things? Well, if you look at Leviticus 17 through 18, these were things that God had told the Gentiles, the aliens, the strangers of the land, right, or in the land. If the Gentiles live among you, right, these are things that they're going to have to agree to, to live in Jewish territory, were these four things, to keep themselves away from things um, uh, stained by idols uh, in order to not practice sexual morality, to stay away from those that were strangled, and stay away from blood. And so um, these were given to kind of appease the situation between the Gentiles and the Jews. If the Gentiles would, um, would live in such a way that, as mentioned in Leviticus 17 through 18, it would help the Jews help to accept them in the faith as uh, converts. If they were God fears, like most of these converts were, they were already doing these things anyways. And so when, when Paul goes and preaches to Gentiles like he does in the first missionary journey, if there are Gentiles who are going to synagogue on the Sabbath and listening to the word being preached, they're already practicing these things from uh, Leviticus 17 and 18. Which is why we're going to see here in a minute when they receive the letter back from James. I'm sorry, I just realized that I didn't have that before you. Um, they're going to rejoice. They're excited. When they get this, this letter to these four uh, prohibitions, it's not like, why are they making us do this? They're excited because uh, it's something that's already being done, but it helps appease the Pharisees and those who are still kind of hardcore Mosaic law. Uh, any questions about verses 12 through 21? No? All right, so they sent a letter back. And verses 22 to 29, we won't read for time's sake, but it's from the church in Jerusalem, the apostles, the elders, and also the members. They sent this letter back to um, the church there in Antioch, the one that had the issue with the false teachers. And they say, look, some guys came from us. We didn't send them. They didn't preach anything that we told them to preach. Don't listen to that. You don't have to be circumcised. Um, do these four things, if you will. They also talk about uh, how much they love and appreciate Paul and Barnabas the things they suffer for Christ and the gospel on those missionary journeys. But they also send two men, Judas Barsabbas. We don't know much about Judas, and he's not a major player in the rest of the New Testament, but Silas is. Uh, Silas is someone who is a prophet, who is a teacher. He's going to be a travel companion of Paul, and he's also going to be a co-sender of Paul's, uh, some of Paul's epistles. He's mentioned in 2 Corinthians 2, 1 Thessalonians 1, 2 Thessalonians 1, and he's also mentioned in 1 Peter chapter 5. And so he was an amanuensis. Now, somebody that went to college or has had a, a class on writing, tell me what an amanuensis is. Impress the class. I know somebody knows it. An amanuensis was a professional writer in the ancient world. Uh, if you wanted to send a letter, oftentimes you would go, you would find a professional writer, and they would write to you. It was a trade. It was a, a craft. They were considered to be... Um, Pretty valuable individuals. Silas was an Emmanuelensis. And so some of the letters that Paul wrote, Paul didn't write any of his letters, we're pretty sure. But Silas wrote some of Paul's letters. Also, 1 Peter chapter 5, Silas also wrote a letter for Peter. And so you have an individual that not only was with Paul on his missionary journeys, but was also with Peter at the end of his life in Rome. 
who wrote letters for Paul and for Peter. And so Silas is a very important New Testament figure, although he's often overlooked. In some of your translations, Silvanus is the same thing as Silas, just a different name, a more Latinized name. And so... Um, he, uh, he includes praise and the success of the missions. And then the great divide happens in verses 30 through 41. Um, Paul wanted to go back and see the congregations they had been to before. Barnabas says, great, let's go back. Let's strengthen the brothers. Let's see how they're doing. And he says, I'll call John Mark and see if he can come with us. Paul says, no, I'm not going back with John Mark. Why did Paul not want to go back with John Mark? Right? Acts 13, right? He had left. Paul said, I ain't taking John. And so what do Barnabas and Paul decide to do? That's right. Barnabas says, I'll take John Mark and I'm going to go to, to Cyprus, which is where Barnabas was from. And Paul says, I'll tell you what, I'll take Silas. We'll go up to Cilicia and we'll go on to Asia Minor. And then on to Greece. And it's interesting because Barnabas goes to his hometown and then Paul goes to his hometown, right? He goes up to Cilicia, which is where Tarsus is. Um, we do see that later in life that Paul does get back together with John Mark and that he's mentioned in Colossians 4. He's also called useful in 2 Timothy 4, verse 11. What are our takeaways? Number one, to confront false teaching. Well, when Barnabas and Paul saw that someone was trying to teach false doctrine in the congregation of Antioch, they stood up and said, this ain't happening, right? At least it's not going to happen with us not saying anything. If we see someone teaching false doctrine, it's important for us to, to say something. We've got to teach the truth in love, but we have to say something. Uh, I think it's really interesting to see the differences that take place in chapter 15. There's a difference in doctrine and a difference in opinion. When it came to the difference in doctrine, whether or not circumcision was a must to be God's people, Paul and Barnabas were willing to argue over that. They were willing to make a stand. They were willing to go back to Jerusalem and say, you've got some people coming from this congregation preaching falsehood. We need to get the bomb of this, get the bomb of it now. Like, we're not going to sweep this under the rug. We're taking care of this. But at the end of the chapter, you see a difference in opinion, right? Whether or not to take John Mark on a missionary journey. And Paul and Barnabas agree to disagree. They love each other. They go their separate ways. No harm, no foul, no bad feelings. So there is a different way that we treat differences in doctrine and differences in opinion. And we see that, I think, pretty well in, in uh, Acts 15. Any uh, questions or comments on Acts 15? No? Well, thank you so much for your comments, for your questions. It was so good to see you. I don't know what you're doing this afternoon, but I'm going home and taking a nap. And so, um, But uh, thank you so much for all uh, your you're concerned. And so, I don't know, I'll probably go home, Bernie, and be like, no, I've had the baby, I'm taking a nap. So, uh, that, might, that might happen. Uh, but thank you so much, and we'll go ahead and we'll close in a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day and for all the many blessings you've given us. We're so thankful for this congregation and for the brotherly affection that we have towards one another. And we're so thankful for this time that we can come together to worship you and then to study your word. Dear Heavenly Father, as we look to the text of Acts 15, please help us to take a stand whenever someone would confuse your word or to try to promote false doctrine, whether out of sincerity or out of maliciousness. Help us to take a stand, to be strong and to be bold and to stand up for your word and for what it teaches. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to see the need in taking that word to those who are lost in sin, that they too can know the salvation and the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. And dear Heavenly Father, please help us as, as your children to live in such a way where we want and have a desire to share that message with those who are lost in sin. And please be with us and watch over us and keep us safe. Here's something we pray. Amen.